In our last lecture, we spent a good deal of time learning about pre-contact Native Americans as well as Africans prior to the rise of the transatlantic slave trade, and we did this in order to set ourselves up to better understand this lecture and to understand what happens when the age of exploration begins and you begin to see the Portuguese and the Spanish and various other European nations uh, looking for trade routes and because of Christopher Columbus and other famous conquistadors and explorers, they end up finding places like Hispaniola and the Americas and the Caribbean. Uh, and as a result, they set into motion a chain of events that really none of them could have foreseen, where there is an uh, explosion of the transatlantic slave trade and they bring essentially decimation to Native American populations in the form of disease and warfare. Plantation agriculture is brought into the southern United States as well as the Caribbean and a system of very harsh slavery follows these developments and in a way the uh, age of exploration and the contact between these three groups marks a turning point in world history History, or the history of the Atlantic, certainly, and nothing will ever be the same again in the places where these three different groups of people come into contact for the first time. Now, I mentioned in our last lecture just briefly that there are a lot of theories uh, of historians and anthropologists and archaeologists about the fact that there were people who arrived in the Americas prior to the arrival of Columbus. And some of these theorize that there were voyages by the Welsh, by the West Africans, by the Chinese, and even as far back as the ancient Egyptians. And so we're going to look a little bit more in depth at each one of these claims. There are a lot of scholars who theorize that Africans must have had some contact with the Olmec civilization. The Olmec civilization was a Native American one that was located in the basin of Mexico where the Mayans would eventually uh, develop their culture. And there are a couple of reasons why they believe this to be true. The first is that there are a lot of plant species that are indigenous to the African continent that have been found in this part of the Americas. The second is that there are some aspects of Olmec culture that look very similar to that of African culture. And one of the sort of hallmarks of the Olmec civilization are these colossal stone heads like the one shown here uh, in the PowerPoint video. And these heads and often the features when they're really analyzed look very much like some of the artwork as well as the features of the African people. And then the last sort of theory as to why the Olmec and the African people may have had some contact is because of European and Arabic accounts uh, that scholars have looked at. Some North African sources in particular describe 400 ships from the Mali Empire visiting the New World, with only one ship returning and reporting the discovery of a Western current, and this was in 1324. Also, according to Christopher Columbus's log, the purpose of his third voyage was to test the claims of King John II of Portugal that, quote, canoes had been found which set out from the coast of Guinea, that's in West Africa, and sailed to the west with merchandise, as well as the claims of the native inhabitants of Hispaniola that, quote, from the south and the southeast had come black people whose spears were made of a metal called guanine, from which it was found that of 32 parts, 18 were gold, 6 were silver, and 8 copper. So when seen in conjunction, these aspects of culture, the African plant species found in the Americas, as well as the interpretations of the accounts of Native Americans and Europeans and Arabs uh, who voyaged during this time period, it seems reasonable that Africa and Mesoamerica could certainly have had some contact prior to the arrival of Columbus. There is also some speculation by scholars that the Olmec civilization came into existence with the help of Chinese refugees right around 1200 BCE, which would have been during the end of the Shang Dynasty. 
At this time, it was right around 500 CE that a group of Chinese Buddhist missionaries actually wrote about having visited Fusang uh, back during the Shang Dynasty, and there are some theories that this is simply the name for North America. And there are certain traits that you see shared between China and the Olmec civilization, and these include the form of their writing, the Chinese practiced oracle bone script, and much of the Olmec uh, letters and characters look much like the oracle bone script. Uh, also, you see the use of jade and batons as symbols of rank. The worship of mountains is seen in both cultures. The knowledge of true north and a north-south orientation of their settlements. The belief in a feline deity and lastly there was a certain type of cranial deformation that was seen in the people of both China as well as the Olmec territory. Uh, more recently in 1885 they discovered uh, Chinese characters in La Venta and also they discovered a vase with very similar written discs in the Olmec territory that was actually caught in the roots of a 300 year old tree. So when you take all of this evidence together once again there's a fairly solid case for the idea that the Olmec had contact with the Chinese and that well before Columbus came to the New World that the Chinese had in fact made some large-scale expeditions out into the Americas. A well-respected pathologist named Svetlana Balabanova has taken samples from mummies and tested their hair, their bones, and their soft tissues in order to discover what kind of chemicals were in their bodies, and she surprisingly found that each of the mummies she first tested had traces of nicotine and cocaine in their systems. And some mummies have actually been found buried with bags of coca leaves, which are the base ingredient of cocaine, or with a wad of those leaves still actually in their cheek. These mummies all tested positive for cocaine, and so in 1992, she then tested hundreds of mummies from places like Egypt, the Sudan, China, and Germany, and these mummies would have been alive anywhere from 800 to 3,000 years ago. Now, she found nicotine showing up almost everywhere, and then in about a third of the mummies, she found coca, or traces of cocaine, in these mummies. Now, because nicotine and cocaine are indigenous to the Americas, this means that Egyptians must have had some kind of contact with the indigenous people as well. The Vikings were some of the greatest sailors in world history, and there have been legends of the Norse actually reaching the New World long before Columbus ever set sail. And those legends are now beginning to become fact as the historical data comes to light that support them. It's now pretty widely accepted by historians that in 986 CE, a Viking expedition was blown off of its course by a severe storm when it was on its way from Iceland to Greenland, and that's probably the first time that they were the Europeans were ever able to lay eyes on the North American continent, and they probably sailed along Newfoundland Island, though there are some people who think that they may have sailed all the way down to Maine. And although this first group didn't really have an interest in founding any colonies in the New World, there is a later Viking that most of you have probably heard of who did. Years after this first expedition, Leif Erikson set out for the new land, which he named Vinland. And therefore, it was several hundred years before any colonies were actually founded by the British, and the Vikings had already established themselves in this new world. The colony is thought to have been very short-lived, though, because probably in part it was very vast and remote, and there were many attacks of Native American people in the area. The very small settlement that was recently discovered at Lansau Meadows is thought today to be the location of this settlement of Leif Erikson, and it's believed that the camp served as a kind of base camp for exploration, and it's possible that the Vikings actually explored as far south as the St. Lawrence River at the border between the United States and Canada. And given this very compelling evidence for their discovery, many historians have still refused to give any credit to the Vikings for their discovery because their new knowledge did not go any further than their own families, and they never really established themselves in 
in the New World. And that honor is really going to go to the Spanish and the Portuguese and then later to the British. But given what we know about their excursion and how much Columbus actually discovered, it seems sort of misguided to give him credit for discovering America when the Vikings saw the mainland of North America several centuries before Columbus ever did. Okay, so this brings us up to talking more about European arrival, which comes after all these other waves of immigrants or explorers coming to the New World. And Western Europe is really the group that leads the push into the New World, as and they do so right as they're recovering at the end of the Middle Ages. They're coming out of the Dark Ages, and they've really been dealing with a lot of difficulties. One of these difficulties includes the bubonic plague, which you might know as the Black Death. Um, in the early 1330s, it first began its outbreak in China and in the steppes where the nomads live just above China. It mainly affected rodents, but of course, the fleas that would uh, be carried by those rodents would then go and transmit the disease to people. And this plague caused a fever and you would get this very painful swelling of your lymph glands called uh, bubos and it would cause these large boils to form and your your flesh would essentially begin to rot before it killed you. Um, the plague spread from China via merchant ships in October of 1347 into Sicily and then it spread throughout Europe and Asia and it struck and killed people with such a terrible speed and about a third or maybe even more of Europe's population died at this point. And if you're wondering what this sort of creepy picture over on the right of the screen is, this is actually what a, um, a doctor in the Middle Ages who was treating a patient of the plague would have worn. And it looks quite scary, but really this sort of beak shape, they would have put posies or a type of flower in the end of it because they believed that one, this would protect them. There were certain, um, almost magical properties to certain herbs and flowers that they believed in and two it would also help keep the sort of stench of decay and death away from their nostrils which they believed could potentially keep them from catching the disease. Europe was also just emerging from several centuries of warfare at this point. They were coming out of the Crusades, and in particular Spain had just emerged from a series of battles against the Muslim Moors in order to gain control of the Iberian Peninsula. And so it was at this point that Spain united into the hands of a Christian monarch, and this was under the marriage of King Ferdinand of Aragon and Queen Isabella of Castile. And this will become important because these are actually the two biggest patrons of Christopher Columbus, who leads an expedition into the New World, even though he does so unwittingly at first. In addition to the Crusades, there were also religious wars that were ongoing in Europe at this time period because of the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation is essentially a schism within Western Christianity or the Roman Catholic Church that's initiated by Martin Luther. And you see a picture here of Martin Luther tacking the 95 Theses up onto the door of All Saints Church. And in these 95 Theses, he lists all of the issues that Protestants have with the Catholic Church. And these range from corruption of the clergy and the church when it comes to money, the fact that the church had been involved in warfare with the Crusades, uh, corruption of the clergy and the Pope uh, as far as sexual immorality and having mistresses or wives on the side, and also the selling of salvation or plenary indulgences during the Crusades. And one of the reasons why the Protestant Reformation uh, became so popular is because of King Henry VIII. And you've probably heard of Anne Boleyn before, and she's tied to the story of Henry VIII. Uh, Henry VIII was married to Catherine of Aragon, and they were happily married for quite some time until he met Anne Boleyn and decided he wanted to divorce his wife. But to make a very long and fairly complicated story short, um, he learned very quickly that the Roman Catholic Church would not allow him to divorce his wife, and by embracing the new Protestant faith that criticized the Catholic Church, he could in fact set aside his wife and marry another. And the story of Henry VIII is very scandalous and salacious because in his lifetime he ends up marrying six different women, and he either gets rid of his wives by killing, by beheading them, or he simply cast them to the side by divorcing them.
And the result of this for many countries is that you're going to find hundreds of years of warfare between people who remain Catholic and those who have accepted Protestantism. So you'll have, for example, the French Wars of Religion, where the Catholics are essentially slaughtering the Huguenots, and it doesn't end until the Edict of Nantes in 1598. And then in Germany, you'll also see the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648. And during this time period, 30% of Germany's population actually dies as they're fighting over religion, and they're killed either from warfare or because of disease and famine, and this doesn't end until the Peace of Westphalia. And America, the foundation of the colonies, is highly influenced by this Protestant Reformation because the Puritans and the pilgrims who initially settle here are members of Protestant sects who don't believe that the Protestant Reformation has gone far enough to actually transform the Catholic Church into one that they would be proud of. And it's during this time of great conflict and turmoil in Europe that the Age of Exploration begins in the 15th century and it goes all the way up until the 17th century. And the reason really why the Age of Exploration starts is because when the Christians lose the Crusades, a series of Muslim gunpowder empires like the Ottoman, the Mughal, the Safavid, and the Songhai spread across parts of Europe, Asia, and Africa, and they essentially block Western Europeans from being able to access the trade routes that would allow them to trade with places like India and China. And so many times the people who end up discovering places like the New World, uh, the Caribbean, and the Americas were actually looking for new trade routes to reach India in order to reach the spices and the luxury items they had become accustomed to being able to trade for. And so this is really how we began contact between the Old World and the New World. It was simply an accident in many cases. Europeans had several motivations for colonization, but the first and probably the most pressing for them was the desire for wealth. They wanted to, of course, bypass those existing trade routes dominated by the Muslims throughout Eurasia because they wanted access to luxury goods. The problem, of course, is that they needed gold and silver to fuel their commerce and a rising banking system. and they wanted to use this gold and silver to purchase spices and at this point spices like pepper for example actually are worth more than gold is but they don't necessarily have a way until they discover uh, gold and silver in the Americas and the ability to mine that to pay the people in India and China for their resources. And so when they come into the New World, the natural resources that they can take from it become a huge source of profit, and these include things like timber and sugar, tobacco and ivory. And the idea there is that there's only so much wealth in the world, and that to make your kingdom stronger, you you have to be sure that you have more than any other and so this kind of competition enhances the idea of what's called mercantilism and the system that exists in the colonial era is that the colonies will create or will harvest the raw materials and then they will ship them over to Europe and Europe will be the ones who create the finished products they'll set the prices usually quite high and they'll ship it back over to the Americas and into Africa as well as the Caribbean and they'll make a huge profit. You can really see this motivation for wealth when you look at the story of Christopher Columbus. When Christopher Columbus first came to the New World, he met indigenous people like the Taino and the Arawak, and he saw that some of them had little specks of gold earrings, or they had a little bit of gold-plated jewelry on. And he immediately believed that this must be a land of plenty where there was gold by the plenty to be taken. And so when he arrived back in Spain after his first voyage, he promised King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella that he would return a second time with gold and slaves if they would just fund his next expedition. He also went ahead and pre-sold some of the slaves to the nobility and to the very wealthy people of Spain. And for this, he was given 17 ships and 1,200 men and sent out on a second expedition. 
Now, when he arrived in Haiti, he began searching for gold, and he didn't have a whole lot of success. So instead, in 1495, he went on this huge slave raid, and he rounded up 500 different slaves. He put them on a boat and returned to Spain. However, during that voyage back to Spain, about 200 of them died. So he had already taken money, and he had promised that he was going to bring back gold and slaves, and here he was bringing back no gold and not bringing back as many slaves as he had promised. So this time he says to his uh, benefactors that he is going to get even more gold, and he also promises them uh, young girls and begins a sort of sex trafficking, the earliest form of sex trafficking, into the old world and out of the new world. And he returns back to the Americas for his third expedition, and his men are ordered to tell any Native American over the age of 13 that there is a quota they must meet each month that they must collect a certain amount of gold. Those who don't collect the amount of gold that they've been told that they have to will either have their nose cut off for a first offense or for a second offense, they would have their hands cut off and they would be sent back to their village to bleed to death as a sort of warning sign. People who attempted to run away uh, usually died because Columbus or his men would sick the dogs on them and they would be ripped to pieces. And some of the natives actually turned to suicide rather than dying at the hands of the Spaniards who were simply interested in extracting wealth from the land. A second large factor that motivated European countries to explore and to ultimately colonize the New World was the Renaissance, and in particular the Renaissance emphasized humanism, and humanism really focused on individual achievement. Unlike in the medieval era, Renaissance people were really concerned with money and enjoyment of life and all of the worldly pleasures that were available, and humanist writers really glorified the individual and believed that man was the measure of all things and that mankind had unlimited potential. And so you see the rise of the printing press uh, by Johannes Gutenberg, and it goes hand in hand with the idea of gaining fame. And individual kings at this point want glory for their kingdoms, and so they begin to spread competition by hoping to acquire and accumulate as much wealth as possible and to go out and conquer new lands. The last major factor that led to the Age of Exploration was the desire to spread the word of God, and most Europeans were members of a universalizing religion, and they believed that spreading Christianity was a good thing. They viewed this really as an extension of the Crusades. So although the Christians didn't necessarily win the Crusades, they believed that they could continue that crusading tradition in the New World. And Christopher Columbus actually believed that since the Europeans had lost their claim to Jerusalem during the Crusades, that God had actually given given them access to the Americas as a way to make up for this loss. And so competition really started to spring up after the Reformation, and colonization became a race to convert Native people to a particular brand of Christianity. And as European powers raced to secure lands in North America, they would send over missionaries to start their work. And so Catholics would go into Spanish missions in Florida and Georgia and California, and then you would also see Catholics in French territory in places like New Orleans, the Mississippi River area, and the Gulf Coast. Protestants, on the other hand, moved into most of the British territories. So the Church of England uh, was in Virginia, and this was an Anglican church. The Pilgrims went into Plymouth Colony, and the Puritans went to Massachusetts Bay Colony. And if you remember from our last lecture, oftentimes Native Americans were able to understand the concept of Christianity by comparing that central figure of the corn goddess or the corn mo mother to the Virgin Mary. And in fact, in many cases, Native American women actually joined convents and became nuns because they understood that connection between the two ladies, and also because they were given a measure of protection and equal treatment in these convents. As an example of the desire to spread Christianity, we have this primary source entitled The Spanish Requisition. 
And oftentimes, when the Spanish would move into the territory owned by Native Americans, they would bring this and read it to them. The problem, of course, is that they would read it in Spanish, and the Native Americans, for the most part, didn't speak Spanish and had no idea what they were saying. So they read, I implore you to recognize the church as a lady, and in the name of the Pope, take the king as lord of this land and obey his mandates. If you do not do it, I tell you that... With the help of God, I will enter powerfully against you all. I will make war everywhere and every way I can. I will subject you to the yoke and obedience to the church and majesty. I will take your women and children and make them slaves. The deaths and injuries that you will receive from here on will be your own fault, and not that of his majesty, nor of the gentlemen that accompany me. So that would essentially be like a foreign country coming into the United States and reading out a mandate that tells us if we don't adopt their specific brand of religion that, and that if we don't bow down to their ruler of their church as well as of their land, that they will enslave our women and children and that they will murder many of our people. And you can imagine how we would take a message like this today if we were even able to understand their language. And Native Americans, of course, would have treated this the same way. When we discuss American exploration by European countries, we're really talking about Spain, Portugal, England, and France. And for the most part, what you learn about in American history are the British colonies, because our 13 original colonies were British colonies. Uh, but And there were some differences between each of these countries, how they settled down, why they began trading and exploring in the first place, but really they tended to follow the same overall patterns. So the steps that I am reviewing now were actually laid out by a historian named Jared Diamond, and he wrote a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel, and we will watch actually a small segment of a video that's been made based on this book, but he seeks to answer the question of how colonization happened and what it was about European colonization that made it so effective. Why was it so easy essentially for them to wipe out the indigenous population of the Americas? And so the first step of course is to send out explorers from each of the various uh, countries. The second step is to basically take your flag and put it into the earth in this new place and claim this land for your own home country. So you conquer any of the native people who have inhabited the land and you accidentally spread disease amongst those natives to make your conquest easier. Although we do have some evidence that there was purposeful spreading of disease as well. The next step, of course, is to start exporting the wealth of the new land, so gold and silver and lumber, and you would take this wealth and send it to your home country, and basically you're stealing these natural resources from the natives. Remember that this feeds into that economic system called mercantilism, where you create the raw materials in the colonies, you export them to the mother country, which then creates the finished product, and ships them back out and charges even more for those colonies to purchase finished goods. The next step in conquest is to send colonists who are willing to settle down and establish permanent roots. And when you send these colonists to become settlers, they must steal even more of the land from those Native Americans who have managed to survive the Great Dying. And then once they've settled down, they'll engage in activities like farming and mining and lumber and the fur trade. But essentially, you're sending people in to help take advantage of those natural resources and to keep this new economic system running and to make sure that there are people there who are loyal to your country to keep other European countries from coming in and attempting to dominate the territory. The fifth stage is to start importing slaves from Africa, and this is particularly important once you've decimated the native population and you need people who will be cheap labor on farms or plantations as well as in gold and silver mines. And then the very last step is to fight with other European nations if they attempt to take your territory. So you want to defend the land that you already own and see to the possibility of expanding into other colonies. And this is really the steps that happen over and over in the colonial era during the French and Indian War and during the American Revolution as well.
If we want to truly understand how it is that the conquistadors and the first settlers viewed the indigenous inhabitants of the Americas, we really have to go back and look at the primary source or first-hand accounts that were written by the conquistadors. And so this particular source comes from Columbus's diary, and this entry is from a 1492 trip, the very first trip, the third day on land. He says, they, talking about the native people, the Arawak, brought us parrots and balls of cotton and spears and many other things. They willingly traded everything they owned. They were well built with handsome features. They did not bear arms and do not know them. I showed them a sword. They took it and cut themselves out of ignorance. They would make fine servants. With fifty men we could subjugate them and make them do whatever we want. So in this passage, Columbus goes from describing how kind the people are and how gentle they are to discussing how easily he could use them for servants and to overpower them. There are some problems, of course, with using primary sources. You really have to think about what the purpose of the author was and who they were writing for. So this particular source that I'm going to read was written by Columbus to the king and queen of Spain. He said, Hispaniola is a miracle. Mountains and hills, plains and pastures are both fertile and beautiful. The harbors are unbelievably good and there are many wide rivers, of which the majority contain gold. There are many spices and great mines of gold and other metals. He reported that the natives are so naive and so free with their possessions that no one who has not witnessed them would believe it. When you ask for something they have, they never say no. To the contrary, they offer to share with anyone. He concludes his report by asking for a little help from their majesties, and in return he would bring them from his next voyage as much gold as they need, and as many slaves as they ask. He was very full of religious talk, and said, Thus the eternal God, our Lord, gives victory to those who follow his way over apparent impossibilities. So if you look at the motivation for Columbus to write this, you have to keep in mind that he clearly wants the king and queen to fund his next voyage. And we already know that the rivers did not contain a bunch of gold and that there weren't huge mines of gold and other metals available to him right away. So he was fibbing to his benefactors in order to sort of further uh, receive support from them. And so while we certainly can believe some parts of his description here, we have to keep in mind that some of this was certainly exaggerated for the benefit of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Now we can move on to the question of why Europeans were able to rather easily defeat the indigenous populations, especially when there were much more Native Americans living here than Europeans when they first arrived. And if you look at the case study of the Aztec and the Inca, they were fairly easily overthrown. The Aztec Empire was first conquered in 1521 by Hernando Cortes or Hernan Cortes. He brought in an army of 600 soldiers and they had some native allies as well, 20 horses and 10 cannons. And and they were able to take down the Emperor Moctezuma as well as his soldiers. The Inca Empire was conquered in 1532 by Francisco Pizarro, and if you're interested, there's actually a very good series on the History Channel called The Most Evil Men in History, and there's one on Francisco Pizarro that you can actually catch on YouTube. Now, he brought with him an army of just 168 soldiers and managed to defeat 80,000 Inca soldiers, which tells us that there must have been some kind of advantage that these Spaniards brought with them to be able to take over in such a short amount of time and with relative ease. So the formula that historian Jared Diamond was able to work out is that there are three different things that gave Europeans the upper hand. The first is the type of weaponry or guns that were available to them. The second is the use of germs or biological warfare, whether it was on purpose or not. And the third is the fact that Europeans had access to steel, which again changed the face of their weaponry. When you compare the weaponry of the Spanish and the Aztec and Inca, we know that the Spanish had steel swords and they would use these against either cane swords or blunt clubs and bronze knives. 
of the Aztec and Inca people, and also the Spaniards had access to guns, and these guns weren't particularly advanced, they would sometimes backfire, they didn't have a very long firing distance, but still this was a kind of technology that the natives did not have at all originally. In addition to the type of weaponry that was available to Europeans, they also had immunity to many of the diseases that had developed. And those diseases first developed after the agricultural revolution when mankind settled down and began to domesticate animals. And whenever humans are in close proximity to animals, there tend to be more diseases that are caught from those animals or transferred back to the animals and back and forth to the humans. And so we know for example that the Black Death or the bubonic plague was going through the old world in the 13th century and that over time when exposed to things such as this people would build up immunities uh, or a resistance and tolerance that the native people never had a chance to build up at this point and so some of the most influential diseases that the natives were faced with were smallpox, influenza, and measles. When you look at the technology available to both groups, you'll see that the primary source paintings and pictures of battles between the Aztec and Inca and the Europeans, the Aztec and Inca typically have a sort of quilted cotton armor on, which doesn't do a whole lot to protect them from uh, gunfire or from a steel sword. And then the Europeans, on their part, they would wear steel armor. And while that was actually usually quite helpful, uh, on at least one occasion, the Aztec chased the Europeans out of their major city, Tenochtitlan, and when they did so, some of these Europeans fell into the waterways as they ran down the causeways, and they ended up drowning because they were wearing this really heavy steel armor, and also they had sort of selfishly loaded their pockets down with gold and forgotten that they wouldn't be able to swim when that was combined with the weight of the armor as well as their very large swords. In addition to these differences in armor, though, Europeans had a huge advantage in having access to horses. The only large domesticated animals that existed in the Americas were llamas and alpacas. And I don't know if you've ever seen one of these animals, but they're much more known for spitting than for you know being able to ride into battle. And then one last type of technology that was available to the Europeans that most Native Americans didn't have other than the Mayans was a written language and with this written language Europeans were able to learn about the battles of other countries and groups against Native people but the Inca and the Aztec didn't have a written language. Remember the Inca had quipu, that series of knotted cords and a sort of proto writing system but they couldn't learn from the experience and the history of another native indigenous group that had already dealt with European invaders. So it was with these advantages that Europeans were able to defeat the indigenous people in both North and South America, and the battle wasn't always easy, and sometimes the native people were able to fight for a very long time, but inevitably always the Europeans won the battles and established colonies, while native populations were almost entirely wiped out. The last thing which we need to understand are the consequences of this conquest. And so we're going to specifically look at changes in the demographics of uh, North and South America, as well as the Columbian Exchange and the growth of slavery and the great dying of native peoples. You've probably heard the term Columbian Exchange before. And this is just a phrase that represents the exchange of plants, animals, diseases, ideas, and technologies that transform both the European and the Native American way of life. And so these could have either gone from the Old World back to the New World or from the New World into the Old World. In some cases they had very devastating impacts and in other cases, like with bringing chocolate back to the New World, they could be a little bit more lighthearted and fun. There were many different plants exchanged between the Old World and the New World. Plants coming out of the New World and into the Old World included beans, squash, chili peppers, sunflowers, chinopods, peanuts, tomatoes, sweet potatoes, potatoes, avocado, pineapple, pumpkin, cocoa beans. 
and maize as well. And probably the two most important of these are maize because it supported European economies and it helped to sustain a really large growth in population. And also potatoes. The um, potato became a huge part of European diet and it was really a staple for them. To the point that in the 19th century when the Irish actually had a crop failure, it led to a very large famine. And then coming out of the old world and into the new world, you find plants such as citrus fruits, grapes, bananas, onions, olive oil, coffee beans, and even wheat, which becomes really very important in the middle colonies. But probably the most important of all of the plants exported out of the old world and into the new is sugarcane. And it's so important because it's the basis of the plantation system in the Caribbean. And those were some of the harshest plantations that existed. And sugar actually becomes the first large scale modern industry. And we needed sugar in order to put it in coffee and tea and also to create chocolate. But most importantly, sugar was needed to create spirits, to create alcohol like rum. And you can get an idea of how important alcohol was by considering that when slavers actually bought slaves in Africa, they often paid African middlemen with rum rather than with a currency. There is also a transferring of animals between the two locations. Uh, New World animals that moved into the Old World included domesticated dogs, South American camels, so llamas and alpacas, guinea pigs and fowls. And the picture that you see in the upper right hand side of the screen is actually a guinea pig that has been fried up because in some parts of South America, because this is one of the animals that was available to the indigenous population, they developed ways and recipes of eating it. But remember, there were no large domesticated animals prior to the beginning of the Columbian Exchange to help with hard labor. Now this all changes when the old world animals make their way over, and these included horses who, with whom you could hitch a plow to, dogs, pigs, cattle, chickens, sheep, and goats. And pigs reproduced extremely quickly. They served as a food source for explorers. DeSoto actually brought 13 pigs with him to Florida, and just three years later there were over 700 pigs. Um, horses became extremely important in developing the culture of Plains Indians, and in particular the Sioux began to dominate the Western Plains as a result of having access to both guns and horses. Cattle uh, supplied explorers with necessary nourishment as well as hides, but then they would go in and they would destroy native crops, so they weren't always such a good thing. And the last probably important animal coming from the old to the new world is the black rat. It would stow away on ships and it would be carrying the plague and typhus, and it often killed off smaller native animals. And then lastly, we have the exchange of disease. And so the old world diseases would often come into a native population that had been geographically isolated. And probably the most devastating was smallpox. It killed tens of thousands of native people. And a very good example of how devastating it could be is what happened in Iceland. In 1707, smallpox first appeared in Iceland. And within two years, 18,000 of the island's 50,000 inhabitants had died because of it. The next couple of slides just quickly review some of the diseases that came from the old world to the new world and what their symptoms look like. If these are still diseases that are transmitted, especially in third world countries, I've included some photographs so that you can see exactly how the disease would manifest itself. Now diseases that were often transmitted from the New World to the Old World included syphilis, polio, hepatitis, and encephalitis. Historians believe that sailors actually contracted syphilis 
in the new world and brought it back to the old world and they began calling this epidemic the pox. The very first of syphilis epidemics began in Naples, Italy in 1495 and when syphilis was first definitely recorded in Europe, its pustules often covered the body from the head to the knees and caused flesh to fall from people's faces, and then it would lead to death within a couple of months. All the way up until the 19th century, syphilis was often treated with mercury, and they would take a solution of mercury and sometimes a kind of zinc chloride, and they would inject this solution for men into their penis. And the treatment was said to be successful if they were able to stand um, the method of treatment without screaming. Despite the fact that there were several diseases that were transferred from the New World to the Old World, it was really indigenous people who suffered the most from the Columbian Exchange when it came to disease. And in fact, between 1600 and 1700, these deadly diseases swept throughout coastal New England and they resulted in what's called the Great Dying. In places like Massachusetts, the death rate amongst native people was as high as 90 to 95 percent in some places. And the specific agent that's responsible for these epidemics isn't necessarily known. It could have been a plague, it could have been smallpox, or it could have been a form of viral hepatitis. By the time you get to the end of the Great Dying, what we do know is that a lot of coastal villages of native people were just left completely abandoned. The land was virtually empty of all the original inhabitants and the buildings were left abandoned. Um, and then once again, these smallpox epidemics will reoccur in the 1730s and the 1750s. Now, you may have heard the term biological warfare before, and this is when a particular group in a war will use disease or some kind of biological weapon to take out their opponent. And historians have really debated about whether or not Europeans used biological warfare, whether they understood that they were passing smallpox along to the native people along with other diseases. And there have been several who have taken the side that no, this was, this was not something they did on purpose. More recently though, we have found some pretty uh, good evidence to support the fact that there was this deliberate distribution of blankets that Europeans knew were infected with smallpox uh, out to native communities. And for example, example, we have a series of letters from Colonel Henry Bouquet um, to his commanding officer, the British General Geoffrey Amherst, and that's whom the town of Amherst, Massachusetts is named after. And in these letters, they specifically talk about infecting native people with smallpox by giving them blankets as a gift, and it, they use it as a way to end the 1763 revolt that we'll talk about later on in the semester, known as Pontiac's Rebellion. So it would seem that yes, in fact, Europeans sometimes very well knew that they were handing disease-ridden blankets to native people and they used it as a tactic of battle. Another particularly important aspect of the Columbian Exchange and the contact between the Old World and the New World is that native people became much more reliant upon European goods. And these goods included some of the European technology, and Europeans had access to metal goods that helped with making cooking pots, knives, and especially guns. And the way that native people would obtain these goods were by trading commodities that the Europeans wanted, like the fur of deers, or the pelt of beavers, or the hides of animals. And what ends up happening is that this really upsets the natural balance of the ecosystem, because native people use guns to begin killing animals for these hides and, and furs and they're able to kill far more animals than they had previously. So one example of this is that in New York, during this time period, the beaver actually goes almost extinct. It's nearly wiped out because of overhunting. In addition, some native people begin to lose their traditional methods of cooking and food preparation. They become so reliant upon using copper um, cooking pots and cast iron pots, as well as on the ready-made food that comes across the ocean on these ships. There is also access to livestock for the first time in the form of cattle, hogs, and sheep, which would seem like a particularly good thing, except that living in close proximity to animals brings animal-borne disease. And 
probably the most important of these new goods that the natives have access to are horses. And this becomes most important for the plains tribes. And it allows for this sort of expansion across the plains and the pursuit of even more bison than they had previously been hunting, as well as an increase in warfare of these plains tribes. Because now not only do they have access to horses, but they also have access to guns. And so the Cheyenne and the Sioux are going to be two of the leading groups that will be constantly warring against each other. And the Sioux in particular Particular will become a very fierce um, force in this territory that the United States will have to deal with in the 19th and the 18th centuries. The last particularly important aspect of the Columbian exchange and this reliance on European goods that I want to talk about briefly is uh, in relationship to the alcohol that was available to natives for the first time. So Europeans for a while at this point have been using alcohol to purchase slaves as well as to control the behavior of slaves and they bring this alcohol into the Americas and begin actually trading with native tribes and they really exploit their enthusiasm for these distilled drinks as a way to subjugate the people. Now Native Americans had this sort of belief that spirits were much like their hallucinogenic plants and they would use things like peyote and the San Pedro cactus and they believed that when they consumed these they would be able to uh, transcend the boundaries of this world and speak with a spirit world and so they assumed the same thing about drinking spirits and they thought that the only way to really reach the spirit world then was to be completely intoxicated so they didn't just drink to imbibe a little bit, but they drank to get drunk every time. If there wasn't enough for everyone in the group to get drunk, then the alcohol would be shared with a smaller number and others would become spectators, and it starts off as having very much a religious and a holy spiritual significance, and eventually there's going to be a lot of issues with alcohol dependency, and even today if you drive through many reservations, you'll see signs up about alcohol addiction and how to get help, because it's not not only has it become sort of a genetic predisposition for some people, but it has remained for generations a problem for some native people that was introduced out of a desire simply to subjugate natives to Europeans' will. Okay, so to sum up everything that we've talked about in this lecture and the previous one, after the first contact, we see that the population of African and Eurasian people in the Americas is growing steadily, but at the same time the number of indigenous people has plummeted. And Eurasian diseases like smallpox, influenza, bubonic plague, and pneumonic plagues have devastated the Native Americans who don't have immunity. In addition, conflict and warfare with Western European newcomers and other Native American tribes even further reduces the population and disrupts their traditional society. Those who don't die are either forced to mine for gold and silver or put on encomiendas. Encomiendas were plantations upon which entire villages of natives might be forced to work and they would toil day in and day out and this was the method of labor that was used prior to the growth of slavery and indentured servitude in the United States. Now the extent and the causes of the decline of natives from their original population of about anywhere from 30 to 50 million um, has been a subject of debate for quite a long time in the academic community, but most scholars do agree that Europeans upon arrival in the New World engaged in a massive form of genocide. And militarily, the first people to arrive are going to be the Spanish conquistadors. They go in and they set up a series of forts in Florida and they establish New Spain. But it's actually going to be the British who are the ones who colonize along the eastern seaboard. And this starts because in 1605, the um, first five natives are taken to England to prove to people in the, in the old world that the new world exists and that the habitants are naive and malleable and it's a way of attracting investment and from there Europeans begin to pour into the new world increasing contact between these two different places. 
and the kinds of relations that we're going to see between each European nation and various native tribes is going to vary over time. Each one will essentially use indigenous people for their own benefit and for their own purposes. And as you're going to come to learn in the course of the semester, during each of the upcoming wars, like the French and Indian War, the American Revolution, and even the Civil War, native people are put in a very untenable situation where they're forced to choose between various sides in battle, and they have no real control or say over these battles, and sometimes they don't even have a dog in the fight. Those who choose correctly are often rewarded, and those who choose incorrectly pay for it with their land, their homes, and sometimes their lives. So the history of contact between natives and Europeans, and then later Anglo-Americans, is one that is rife with violence, broken treaties, the stealing of land, and ultimately the deaths of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people.